Next up, we have a team from Temple University. We have Anshul Rege, who's an associate professor there, along with PhD student Rachel Blyman. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anshul Rege. I'm an associate professor with the Department of Criminal Justice at Temple. And I'm here today with my amazing uh, graduate research assistant, Rachel Blyman. And today we want to share with you how we are using pre-attack and attack uh, in the social sciences for cybersecurity and cybercrime education and research. We want to thank MITRE for the opportunity to let us share what we're doing with you all today. And of course, we want to stand, uh, thank our uh, funders, the National Science Foundation, um, because without them, we couldn't do what we're doing today. So on the agenda, we're going to talk about how we're using pre-attack for cybercrime and security education. Uh, Rachel is then going to share with you how we've been using attack for some of our re research data sets. And then we're going to end with uh, a summary and talk about where we'd like to go with, uh, you know, what we're doing in education and research. So let's get started with that first component. Um, how are we using MITRE um, free attack framework in security education? I teach a cybercrime course in the social sciences. The emphasis here is on the human aspects of cyber attacks and security with an emphasis within that on social engineering. Uh, the class is composed of students from multiple disciplines. So we have not just social science students, but we also have computer science and engineering students. We've got we've grouped them up in about eight different groups that have both social and computer science students in them. The objectives of one of the assignments that they have is we're trying to map uh, the pre-attack framework to social engineering case studies to help students learn how these frameworks can be used to conduct threat intelligence, but also to understand the limitations of both the case studies and the framework. So we've got about six uh, social engineering case studies with a lot of details. And students will be required to look at the overall mapping to the pre-attack framework, uh, the specific expansion on certain tactics and techniques that they find, and then identify mitigation strategies uh, identified in the framework and also extend beyond that. Uh, this was our first attempt this semester to try something like this, but we're hoping to learn and grow in this So students, like I said, we're going to be given um, six different case studies. Uh, within each case study, they would then map it all to the overall framework, as you can see by the highlighted boxes here. So if they find certain components, they would map it on. But then the idea here is we want them to think about things like what is the proportion of mapping? How much of the case study were you able to successfully map? onto the framework because then this gets them to think about the implications. What does this mean for the case study, right? Do we see certain patterns? Um, can we identify if certain tactics and techniques are useful? And of course, then what are the implications for pre-attack in the sense that how well does it apply to social engineering? Now we're aware that pre-attack is gonna be restructured and possibly merged with attack uh, but this is what we're doing uh, in, in the fall semester. We'll be adapting this project moving in the future. So once they've done this overall mapping, they then have to zoom into a specific tactic and try to identify things along the lines of techniques, uh, similar techniques that fall under that tactic to again identify relationships. Uh, see if they can come up with any detection measures uh, as identified in the framework and, of course, dive into the difficulty level for the adversary. But in addition to this, uh, we want them to think about mitigation for social engineering. So currently, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, Meyer's uh, attack website under mitigations, they have mitigations listed for enterprise and mobile. And we are trying to get our students to think about, well, what would something similar look like for pre-attack for social engineering? What would be those mitigation strategies? And if none exists, students are then encouraged to recommend mitigations. And these might take the form of, for instance, policy or training and awareness, right? Moving beyond that technical domain. So the overall then objective here is that students learn about threat intelligence, about mapping, about identifying patterns and trends, 
and also uh, about mitigation. So these are our efforts in the education space. I'm now going to pass it on to Rachel to talk about what we're doing for the data sets. So Rachel. Hey, thanks, Anshul. So through our Cybersecurity in Action Research and Education Lab website, which is sites.temple.edu slash care, we offer free downloads of the course projects along with two data sets that we've created and re have recently mapped onto the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Both of these data sets are updated on a monthly basis. The first data set we have is a repository of social engineering incidents. We currently have 623 incidents recorded spanning from 2011 up through August 2020. The second data set consists of ransomware attacks against critical infrastructure. And this data set has 747 incidents ranging from November of 2013 up through September of 2020. All of the incidents that we gather for both of these data sets is completely based on publicly disclosed information that we collect from Google Alerts. And a couple of months ago, we received some feedback from people who use the ransomware data set, and they asked if we could map it onto the attack framework. So we did that, and we decided to also map the social engineering data set onto the framework as well. So on the table on the left here are some of the variables that we record in the social engineering data set, including dates, who the target is and where they're located, what social engineering tactic is used, the monetary cost of the attack, who the attacker is, and some information about the ploy of the attack. About 50% of the social engineering tactics in our data set mapped onto the attack techniques or software. The primary techniques we were able to match were phishing and spear phishing, but there were also some instances of malware that mapped onto the software in the framework. And then we also mapped about 23% of the attackers onto the attack group slash attacker. So group 32 or Lazarus group appeared several times and was the most common, while groups 59, 92, and 94 were also repeatedly mapped. Moving on to the critical infrastructure ransomware data set, our variables record information about the date and location of the attack, who was targeted, what strain of ransomware is used, and details about the ransom. And in our transition from the ninth iteration to the 10th iteration of the data set, we began mapping onto the attack framework. We first removed all incidents where the strain was recorded as not pet yet, as the attack framework defines not pet yet as a wiperware and not a ransomware. Uh, we then mapped the ransomware strain variable onto the attack software ID. About 56% of the strains mapped onto the attack software. And these eight softwares are the ones that appeared in our data set repeatedly and included Maze, Locker Goga, NetWalker, Ragnar Locker, Robinhood, Raya, SamSam, and WannaCry. And we did experience some challenges and found some limitations with mapping our data set onto the attack framework. In the social engineering data set, Many of the social engineering tactics do not currently exist in the framework, such as whaling and vishing. And while our mapping results did show that about half of the tactics mapped over, the bulk of our incidents in this data set are phishing and spear phishing attacks, which the framework does include, which raised that percentage for us. Uh, we had very few techniques besides phishing that mapped onto the framework. And in the ransomware data set, we were unable to map a portion of the strains some strains that appear frequently in the data set, such as Revil, uh, and has been around for some time, uh, does not, do not yet exist in the framework. And other strains that are newer, such as Ransom X, are also not yet in the framework. Great, thanks, Rachel. So I'm just gonna bring everything to a close here and, and share with you some of, some of the reasons why we're using this, right? In the education space, uh, I, as an educator, certainly found pre-attack to be extremely useful because it helps our students develop the ability to map and understand threat intelligence, um, and also the ability to understand challenges and limitations. I think what's really cool is we're trying to map um, social engineering cases, which is not typically done. Um, so I think that's an interesting exercise in and of itself from the social science perspective. What I also like about this is it isn't technical enough, so all disciplines can engage. I have a lot of social science students who can actually participate in this and get a top level understanding 
of threat intelligence. So I think that this is a really, really cool exercise uh, for my students to try out. From a data set perspective, um, interestingly, when Rachel and I started this, uh, we were struggling to get data because for obvious reasons, companies don't want to share it or government doesn't want to share it. So we said, you know what, let's create our own data set and we'll share it with other uh, folks in the academic domain. And so we've had a lot of educators and students, of course, uh, request this data, um, which, which was great because um, it, it um, allowed us to fulfill sort of our objective of sharing this with the wider academic community. But interestingly, we got a lot of requests from governments, not just in the US, but around the world, and also industry from all over the world that was interested in, in getting a copy of our data set and hey, let's you know, see if we can look at trends and patterns across ransomware strains, uh, comparing the data to their own internal data set, uh, raising awareness and for training. And what was really cool is uh, mapping it onto MITRE really, really improved the quality of our data set. It gave our data set a lot of credibility. Um, and we got a lot of responses saying, thank you for mapping this. This is gonna help us out big time. So that is, uh, you know, and the really cool thing is it was after we mapped it onto the MITRE framework, we actually got um, the data set was actually picked up by Security Week and also uh, mentioned our lab was mentioned in Leaping Computer, which was, again, another big win for us because we're a team of two trying to do something like this. And it's lovely to see that our efforts are having an impact and benefiting the wider community. So one of the things that we want to do is, like I said, we're aware that free attack and attack are going to be restructured, merging. Um, and I know that free attack and attack has helped me in the social science space, right? Helped me with my education and research efforts. What I would love to do is to see how we in the social science domain, uh, through our education and research efforts, can contribute back to free attack and attack. And this is what our previous speaker uh, mentioned as well, is how can we be uh, contributing? We're trying to create data repositories. Uh, I, I remember, um, you know, where do we go to get data, right? So we're looking at indictments. We're looking at social engineering case studies. We can conduct focus groups and interviews with social engineers. And we're also trying to weave it into what we've just started at Temple is a collegiate social engineering capture the flag uh, competition and training event. So, uh, can we use MITRE's uh, attack frameworks to sort of shape that exercise and in turn use student experiences to then contribute back to this framework? So if anyone's interested in any of this, we are definitely seeking collaboration. We'd love to hear not just from academic communities, but also from industry and government and of course MITRE. Uh, so that's everything that I had. Um, we can, I guess, take it up for questions. Fantastic talk. And like people are going nuts over this data set. And like I said, I love that you touched at the end of like how it was truly a grassroots effort to like, you know, compile that and build it yourself. Uh, I think the biggest question is, um, like you said, I, I love the idea of, like you said, no matter how technical things are, it's all, there's a human element to all this works. So my biggest question is, you know, have you seen themes um, in terms of the, the mitigations that your students are putting together for these attacks that you can share with the wider community, the things that we can do to kind of you know, prevent or at least like, you know, mitigate it to some degree these layer eight um, human based uh, behaviors? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I'm going to respond, uh, respond in two parts here, I guess. Uh, one is it's primarily been policy, you know, uh, appropriate behavior, what to click on, what not to click on. So a bit more on the education and training aspects of this. But I love that because it's a multidisciplinary class, you're getting computer scientists to really think about this, right? This is the next generation workforce of computer scientists who are going to be developers and defenders. And so thinking about using these frameworks, not just in the technical aspect, but also on the human uh, domain, right? That surf, I think is really getting them to think about that as they go out and design and defend systems. So that, you know, uh, it's impossible to really give your, aunt, your question a, um, an effective response in the short time we have, but I'm happy to, uh, carry on that conversation in the classroom. That makes a lot of sense. Like you said, you can only build a wall so strong if someone's just going to open the door with the point. But yeah, with that, thank you. Thanks again for a great presentation. That was really excellent. Like I said, there's a lot of uh, Slack activity going on. So definitely hang around and ask some questions. But, great. Thank you uh, all.